Hello, everyone, and welcome to another um, edition of our Alien Incubators Hangouts. We have a special um, topic today on mental management, and we are joined by three special incubators. Uh, we have Felix Enkel, who is the Vice President of Health Professions Education at Health Partners. We have Nicole Battaglioli, who is a junior faculty member at um, the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. And we have Simran Buttar, who is a education fellow, soon to be Ultrasound Fellow, um, who's also joining us. And my name's Adara, and I'm an Ultrasound Fellow currently at the Brigham. And I am excited that we're talking about middle management. So I think it's a very important topic for all of us who are just starting out in our career. You know, we're managing uh, residents. Some of us are working on projects with senior attendings. And we need to know some sort of guidance. We need to, like, we need to have some sort of guidance on how to progress as we develop our careers. So we brought on Felix, who is an expert in so many different topics when it comes to professional development. We wanted to ask Felix just quickly, why is middle management so important for us who are just starting out with our careers? Great. Well, thank you, and thank you for having here. I'm, I'm truly honored. Uh, you know, before I had my, my job, I was a residency director for a dozen years, and I think the, the number one thing that I, I felt that our chief residents sometimes would stumble on would be on, on management techniques. And, uh, you know, a couple of things that made me think of it, you know, sometimes there's a difference between being liked and being respected. 90% of the times you can have both. 10% of the time you can have either or. I think I view... I view leadership and management slightly different. Uh, I actually view management as a design process of, of you lead people and you manage things or projects. And I think uh, well-managed or well-designed residency programs are great. I mean, if you can think of yourself, uh, I mean, we have an innate sense when things aren't really designed well, when processes aren't designed well, how it, it just kind of gives a feeling of a brand of, of something you don't want to be involved with. So whether it's managing meetings, managing schedules, managing an educational process, I think uh, those management techniques, if you take a little bit of time to see about doing them well, I think it'll catalyze everything else. I see. And so from your personal experience, how do you how, how does one develop, like we're focusing on management skills today, those sorts of skills so that they're able to design a project effectively? Uh, so a couple of things is there's, you know, as in anything, there's some basic knowledge. So if, if it's project management, uh, uh, there's some basic books on project management. If there's how to run a meeting effectively, there's some basic books on doing that. But it's, it's not only the cognitive stuff, it, it's really looking in your surroundings and learning from others that do it well, and then just see how people don't do it well. Uh, often people learn not only from their mentors, but from their anti-mentors. And um, I think it's a continually learning process. I actually view management as a discipline rather than a task. Management is something you always try to design better and do better. I'm, I'm going to kick it. Over. I'm going to kick it over to Nicole and see if she has any particular questions for Felix. Hey, Felix! So awesome to have you on. You're always so full of awesome wisdom, and I always get the best recommendations from you. You kind of recommend, or you kind of mentioned, you know, sometimes you get management skills from reading a book. Sometimes it's from looking at mentors, and I like your thoughts of. Sometimes you get it from your anti-mentors or just kind of noticing things or patterns that you don't like or don't want to adopt. Do you have any book recommendations just off the top of your head? Um, you know, if someone really wanted to just on their own learn more about management skills, uh, any recommendations and why you recommend that book? Um. So I always go the basics. So I actually started, uh, you know, there's management for dummies just uh, so I can pronounce the words and figure out what actually is is management. And so my recommendation is is to get the latest uh, 
uh, uh, addition of management for, uh, for dummies. I think Harvard Business Review is 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 one which which they not only the Harvard Business Review articles, but once you um, subscribe from that. Uh, you can actually get these little snippets every day, management tip of the day. So you're actually learning not in a bolus, but in a in, in a drip sort of approach. So if you have an institutional subscription, Harvard Business Review, my recommendation is is you know you can browse the the table of contents for the Harvard Biz Business Review articles, but you can actually uh, sign up for these daily little tips. Awesome. I'll definitely have to take a look at that. I haven't looked at that yet, but it sounds like it might be super valuable. So let's just put out kind of a theoretical situation um, that someone might kind of face as, let's say, a chief or even like I'm a junior faculty member. Um, let's say that a nurse or somebody comes up to you with a concern about another resident. And let's say you're a chief resident. And this is about one of your colleagues, whether or not it's someone who's the same year as you or maybe it's a junior resident. But the nurse brings up the concerns with you because she knows you know, you're a chief and is kind of wondering if you can do something about it. Um, how do you kind of handle or go about, you know, should I address those concerns myself? How do I go about addressing concerns? When do I... When do I recognize that I need to maybe bump up the issue to that next level of management? Um, do you have any kind of tips for navigating those potentially murky waters? Sure. So I have um, several tips. Number one is management is it is in a sense also boundary management. It is, it, and the first boundary I would say is is to really have a clear understanding before you're a chief resident on what belongs to you and what not. What is the residency director's job? What is the chief resident's uh, 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 job? And so in, in terms of information flow, I also view management from the kind of conceptual model is it's helping having shared mental models, uh, streamlining behaviors and having a design. And often the shared mental model is one of the reasons we have meetings or we have communications. And so if a nurse would approach me as a chief resident, first of all, I would have had a discussion or I would have ideally had a discussion with my program director to say, how do you want me to handle these pieces of information? And my, in, in general, program director is saying, you know what, most of this, uh, things that you hear once unless it involves you know depression or substance abuse help manage and if it's from a relational issues is often if you have a piece of information I would ask the person giving the piece of information what would you like me to do with this information is this an FYI is this want to change a behavior if this um, or anything else often and I think as an emergency physician we're tempted to go into fix-it mode someone's giving me a piece of information for another resident I need to fix this but if you ask what do you want me it's like no this is just an FYI if you hear it three or four times that's one thing it I just needed you to listen not to fix it part of boundary man so second thing is part part of boundary management is 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 sort of triangulation management my recommendation is in general if someone is telling me something about another person i ask them is this something where the three of us can discuss or talk the first few times it doesn't work well, but people ultimately then appreciate that you're a facilitator of conversations with that. And I think that is a key management technique, that you're still receptive for feedback, but you encourage people to talk directly. I think that's something that I struggle with also. Um, like a few days ago, I had this very uncomfortable encounter. I actually didn't even directly interact with the person. I was just a, sort of a fly on the wall where there was a consult who was incredibly rude, not only to the patient, but to um, another resident. And 
I wasn't managing the patient, but I was in the room just for helping out. And I could tell that the resident wanted someone to intervene, but it didn't seem like the right place or time. And, you know, I, again, I, even though I'm a fellow, I'm clinically attending, but I'm so junior. And then the, the other attending was way more senior, and then the resident was right junior. And I just wasn't sure when to step in or how to step in or if I should. Um, and I, I, I do find these like awkward interpersonal situations like the hardest to deal with where there's some sort of conflict sitting there and it's not just like a matter of like this is a product I'm learning everyone's getting along I just don't know how to fix the project this is more like these are people who are not getting along I don't know how to fix the personality or things that are occurring yes so um, this skill or discipline is one of those things where I, I think it's never done. I think intellectually, again, there's something called the Cartman Triangle, if you Google it up, K-A-R-P-M-A-N-N. And what it is, is people sometimes fall into these roles where there's their perpetrator, the victim, and then the savior. And you see that sometimes with families that really advocate for patients or in hierarchical sort of things. And if sometimes that actually becomes unstable where the perpetrator feels like they're victimized, the victim that becomes a savior and the savior becomes the perpetrator and it just keeps on going. If you can reframe the conversation as sort of the creator, the challenger and the coach. So you're not in a savior mode, but you know, coach mode. I think that is ultimately helpful. The other thing from my point of view is, in um, boundary issues, sometimes some of these behaviors under stress are in the subconscious and people have these huge blind spots. So if I hear someone that is rude and I'm not in charge, but I can hear it from it, I say something like, hey, you know your voice travels. You know, and that is not something judgmental or anything. It says your voice travel. People are like, well, why are they talking about my voice or something like that? Um, so I often try sometimes more of a softer thing that people recognize that I recognize something uh, uh, to do that. The last thing is, is I try not to make it about the other person, but about my own personal feelings. So rather than you're rude, you know, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable with this language. You know, it's, 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 it's ultimately, if that person has insight, if you say, I feel a little uncomfortable with that language, they should change. If they can't, you as a, in the middle management are probably not going to be able to change that dynamic at the point of care. And that is, again, where either talking with the, the resident that you saw on the receiving end of some abusive uh, behavior or talking to the program director of that. Chief residents often are the, sort of the, the canary in the coal mine when it comes to disruptive behavior. So on one end, you don't want to uh, sort of blackball a person and you don't want to jump into gossip. But you may be the first person that hears, you know, a couple comments that just seemed a little off color and too much. And if if you can have early interventions in in in, in sort of a, a professional way, that actually may help the person that may have a huge blind spot. So I don't know if that is helpful, but that is happens in the ER all the time, as you all know. Felix, I feel like part of what you touched on has to do with some of that like disruptive behavior and and what kind of um, causes it. And sometimes it's, you know, personal issues with that individual or, or you know, things going on. Um, let's say that it's not just a, an angry consult that you're kind of interacting with for a short term. Let's say the behavior or the issues are coming from like one of your colleagues and you're just kind of noticing you know, a lot of disruptive behavior as a junior faculty member, you're noticing this kind of behavior from someone who that, you know, you're supervising and you have kind of a more long-term 
relationship with. And so maybe you have to address it more than just kind of mentioning, you know, hey, I can hear you or wow, you know, you seem upset today and you might need to delve a little bit deeper. Do you have any suggestions or tips on how to kind of initiate that discussion or have that discussion with someone that you may have a longer relationship with or a supervisory role to? Yeah, so so I feel that if we're in education or we're in healthcare, I think we have an obligation if we see disruptive behavior or unhelpful behavior to address it. Uh, and the question is, is it, is it, um, and so there's a sort of this, this hierarchy, hierarchy of, of addressing it. There's a couple books called Crucial Conversations and Crucial uh, Confrontation, if you look that up, uh, uh, which it, but, you know, I don't know if, for example, if you have a, for instance, I can, I can be more specific. If not, I'm happy to talk about generalities. Well, sometimes, I mean, especially like when you're a chief or you might notice like there's always, you know, one or two people in the group who are kind of always complaining about, uh, you know, things that are going on and, you know, maybe aren't as active in coming up with helpful solutions or, you know, strategizing a solution to the problem and just kind of would rather complain or kind of talk negatively about things and, um or maybe somebody who, um, you know, whenever they come on shift, they're just, you know, kind of disruptive and rude all the time or loud and, and you know, not really conducive to like a teamwork type environment. So yeah, no, so great. So it's someone, go ahead. I was, sorry, I was just going to say, as a, yeah, as a chief, you might feel the need to, you know, chime in and address that in some way. Yeah. So, yeah, typical, uh, not a typical, hopefully atypical example, but uh, uh, someone fairly negative, uh, uh, maybe more focused on themselves than others, uh, uh, you know, how do you address them? And I, again, I usually pull them by and say, you know, seeing that, are you okay? You know, depending on the behavior is if the behavior is way out of way, I just tell them, you know, these are the sort of behaviors based on my experience. I wonder if there is either a mental health or depression issue or substance issues. So that's usually the shock value of that, depending on if, if that's appropriate. Or if it's sort of, hey, you know, I'm the chief resident, you know, the things I see those are what thing, p things people are worried about or think about. And there's one of two things happens. Either with insight is, oh, you know, I had a bad day. I didn't know it was there. I'll keep in touch. Or there's a defensiveness is, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, I did those three night shifts, and I had to do this, and I had to do this, and everything like that. And then I just say, well, you know, it's something we should continue talking about, you know, of that. Um, but the, there's a huge difference of if people are receptive to feedback and have insight versus don't, you know, one is sort of, in my mind, the stereotype of someone that's going down a little bit of an impairment or potentially impairment. They're under stress. There's some things under the, the home life. They're, uh, uh, not feeling connected and all that, and they want to get better. The other one is maybe sort of a subclinical or a personality issue that's been there all along and that may now be a mask in residency. Those are much tougher. And I would say the the the, the personality issues in a resident or the uh, are not a sole chief resident issue. And and one of the issues in residencies is to have a chief resident manage a personality issue without the program director sometimes can backfire. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think it's good advice. 
I had a few questions as well. I know you were talking a little bit about uh, delegation and wanting to be everyone's friend. That's something that I kind of struggle with. I think like as a new faculty member, one of the reasons I went into education was because I wanted the residents to have someone that they found relatable and approachable and fun to work with. So I often mm -hmm. struggle with the delegation perspective, which is similar to when I was a senior in terms of like mentoring juniors. Um, I want them to feel, I, I think one, I'm relatively new and um, I'm younger than a lot of them are uh, about the same age. So it's hard to take the role of, um, of like their superior, but how do I delegate or or tell them things that could be constructive to their development without losing um, like the fun attending that is approachable? No, excellent question. Um, you know, I think I got burnt out after a few years because I forgot about what the difference is to having a responsibility for the program versus a responsibility to the program. That all turned into this program that was my program. Even by that self, it's, it's not the medicine program, it's my program. You know, once you have that, that's almost a boundary issue in itself. That I felt that everything that happened to that program somehow was my responsibility. I finally flipped it into, I have a responsibility to the program, which means I'm honest, I can't lose anything, nothing left. I think that allowed me to have a, a little bit more of a, 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 a sense of purpose that I'm here to help others. I'm not here to do the everything to everyone, to the program is to be healthy in my boundaries. In terms of delegation, I used to want to not stuff that because I, I did not think it was educational or this and that. But then I realized that people were less and less engaged and uh, I was having a more of a difficult time doing things and I wasn't people's friends or I wasn't feel, uh, felt as being supportive. So what then I started doing was just having lots of conversations that I chose a couple of things that I was going to a control, quote unquote. I was going to work on the narrative of our residency. I wanted to make sure that people had an accurate story if they were going to train with us, what they were going to do. And in terms of resources or the budget, I was going to do that. Uh, just because I felt like if, if we were going to have the residency to the narrative that I wanted, I needed to have the resources or at least some security with the resources to do that. I offered them delegation. Uh, and essentially a lot of the management issues, a lot of the educational issues that ultimately I tried to make myself obsolete rather than indispensable. At first I thought people would, I was worried that people thought I was going to be dumping work on them. In fact, the opposite happened. When I said, okay, why don't we share this? Why don't we go halvesies on this? People would do that. And people actually, wanted to do some of these things, what they really wanted mostly is just contact with me and support. It wasn't a transactional issue about the work. It was more a relational issue about a shared mental model. So I don't know if that answered the question on that. Uh, I think the one thing I would just add on that is if you are the new chief resident or if you are the new faculty, Often you're stepping in a role where people have preconceived notions of who you should be. And if you don't have your own plan of who you want to be, you may end up being in a position 
where you have 10 or 12 people saying this is who you should be and you're trying to figure out who you want to be. And my recommendation is just do a little bit of reflective practice on, on, on what your style with, would, will be in your management or delegation on that. I'd be interested in hearing from, from others in terms of the, the, the delegation skills or habits on how that has worked or not worked. One of the things um, that I never liked when I was a resident or what I oversee that I don't like is when people uh, I, like senior attendees would say, hey, you should do this or you should do that. So if I want something done, one of the things that I've done like this year and probably last year is like, let's say I want someone to be on a monitor because I think they're sick. So instead of like directly asking the resident, hey, can you put the patient on the monitor? Yeah. I'll do it and then tr hope that me modeling like that behavior, like this is really important to me because this patient is sick. So I'm going to go put them on a monitor myself and hopefully not, like you see that like this is important to me and I want it done right away. And then next time, instead of me telling you to do it, you'll say, hey, like this seems like it's important. I don't know that it always works or it comes across, but I, th I have a hard time. I have a really hard time with a you do this, you do that, because it sounds like very like I'm the attending just telling you things to do, and I don't want you to just do things. I want you to know why and want to do them yourself. Hmm. That's interesting because I could see a resident. I'm just no, I agree. And so the whole. Sorry. I was just going to say that it's interesting. I can see that as a see myself as a resident maybe not liking that behavior as much only because you know a junior attending is almost always going to be the micromanager because they're still so used to being the pgy3 or pgy4 senior resident and so but i think it's an interesting perspective i never thought about it as, as like the modeling behavior um i think most in residents might interpret that as like the micromanager or very like overly involved attending but i see and i respect your your approach which is that if you see that it's important to me that maybe then you'll pick up my behaviors it's more of a you know do not tell I guess um, approach which is um, yeah very interesting I just never thought about it that way I mean I got made fun of when I was a senior because they were always like oh you just do everything yourself like you're just the person who does everything yourself yeah so but I, I just I have a very hard time with with like delegating just because for some reason I don't I don't know I I never liked it when when I see like when I like when you're told to just like you need to go see that patient or you need to go do that or you need to go do that like for some reason I'm not comf not super comfortable with doing it that way one approach that I've tried recently is more of like a um, I don't know if this is a better approach, but I've tried this over the last couple of months, which is when I run the board, I, you know, with the patient or with the resident, I sort of go through like a systematic approach of things just so that they can try to self, so they can try to discover on their own or yourself what's missing or what have they not yet done for this particular patient. And so they kind of come to the conclusion on their own. It doesn't always work. And sometimes I still have to mention things, but, um, I, I agree with you, like, you don't want to tell people all the time, especially, sometimes it's just faster, just like you said, just to do it on your own. And, um, yeah, I don't think I have the, the, the exact, Felix probably has the perfect answer to this question. <laughs> but I figured I'd chime in with my own personal struggles, because I, I don't know either. I, I just think that it's, as much as you can try to pull something from them and have them come up with their own answers, they become more engaged and more involved in that care of the patient. Felix, I know you have the answer on the tip of your tongue. <laughs> no, I mean, this is a great cup. I, I, I do not have uh, the answer. I mean, this is a this is great uh, conversation. You know, culture, in my mind, is language artifacts and celebrations. And so language is, is huge. And so for me, whenever I hear the word should, there's already a judgment in that. You know, and so I sometimes push back and like, oh, you're a shooter or something like that. However, of communicating, and I, I come from Minnesota, but I trained in Chicago, two different 
styles of communicating direct versus indirect. I, um, I'm now 80% bureaucrat and 20% clinician. And so I come back to an environment where probably, you know, some of the residents don't know me as well if, if, if uh, uh, they did when I was, used to be the residency director. And every once in a while, there's a little bit of an interaction where, you know, I feel more comfortable if something hap were to happen. It's usually I'm a little more conservative on this and that. Residents also, you know, want to try something new or everything. So I never tell them you shouldn't do that. I just say, you know, tell me why you would do that. Or if I give them a reason to go down the more conservative route and say, you know, I would feel more comfortable if this patient is on the monitor and here's the reasons. The last three times we did this conscious sedation with this and this and this, uh, you know, one of the times this happened, that remind having direction, I think what they want is the, a reason for the direction. Even if that reason is, I got a feeling. <laughs> Uh, it may not be evidence-based, it may be anecdotal, it may be that. If, if there's still back and forth, it may, that may be unrelated to the patient at hand and may be related to the culture of whatever emergency department people are uh, working on is how language is used and how artifacts are used. Felix, I'm curious. Um, in I don't know if that makes sense or not, but I. Uh... Yeah, that does. And I'm curious, um, in your own personal experience, what have been some sort of landmark behaviors or just very notable positive behaviors that you've witnessed in your junior faculty members as far as them demonstrating that they've understood how to sort of navigate the mental management of you know entering a new institution new politics, new culture, um, has there been, have there been any sort of people, have there been any people or instances or, or actions that sort of stand out to you that you, that we can maybe take back with us as far as, well, we'll try to use that in our, in our careers. Yeah, so the, the number one is, is, you know, first three or six months is, is, um, ears open, mouth shut. You know, I can tell you, and I probably didn't do that as much as that I was really excited in my first job. And I wanted to let everyone know how excited I was. And I wanted to let them know about all the techniques I could bring from my residency and all these suggestions I had, how we could increase flow or do this or that. I think uh, there's a great book called The First 90 Days. You can actually get a app on it too is is about the more you resist the urge to speak is by the time you do speak or have it the more people are engaged to you and so it's this almost this incredible tension of 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 seeing the lay of the land and learning everything you can do at a time where you're ready to run. You're ready to run because you're just residency trained, studying for your boards, ready to run. You can see, especially if you're not, your first job is not at where you trained, what you will see will be three or four things that could be done better. And I would urge people to resist that urge is just to learn to learn if people ask questions answer questions if people ask you about your old residency answer it but um ears open mouth shut for the first three to six months mm. does that make sense yeah i feel like i have such a hard time with that and i feel like i've already gotten myself in a little bit of a pickle where i'm at um <laughs> and there's already been some skirmishes uh maybe just ruffled a couple of feathers but i also got that advice when i first started from a very wise person and i just feel like i was not able to apply it do you have any suggestions or techniques for like taming the inner want to do it better skirmish instigator type 
person that may be lingering in some of us? Well, my advice is to be authentic, number one. And so I also have a hard time keeping my mouth shut. And so what I do is ultimately, whether it's humor or not, I'm like, hey, I'm going to say something. Just be warned, sometimes my mouth opens and it closes 30 minutes later. I'm working on it or something. So it disarms people and saying, here's what I – or another tendency is to really to be – academic or cerebral or professorial and everything. It's like, hey, you know, this is the this is the reason why we need to change this. And people just tune out. Um, so I just tell people that that is who I am and to work with me together. Um, uh, the It's interesting now being in a little bit of a, 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 a different position is – when I left residency, I viewed it all about the knowledge and the, and the procedural skills. If I was, if I knew the diagnosis, worked the hardest, was the most proficient in, the, in, in, in procedural skills, uh, and made sure everyone around me was just like that, the ER would be fine and I would bring value. I totally, totally, totally underestimated emotional and social intelligence, the importance of teams, the importance of psychological safety in teams, you know, that at com in, in meetings, which is another medical, uh, uh, middle management uh, thing, I now observe to see who is speaking to make a point and who is speaking to make a difference. Who is speaking to maximize a position and who is speaking to elevate a conversation? And when I, I start realizing here are the people that are actually trying to make a difference and elevate a conversation rather than making a point and maximizing a position, I realized those are often people a little bit more in the background, a little bit more moving beyond just procedural competency and medical knowledge and a little bit more sensitive in terms of the team and the care that patients get. So in terms of specifically, as we say, rather than what we're struggling with. Yeah, I, I'm also um, nervous because I, so I just accepted the position um, of APD here at Brigham and um, I have already violated the ears open and mouth shut <laughs> tremendously. So I think moving forward, it's actually something I'll try to keep in mind. I think it's tough because, you know, the culture that the and I have been in, um, especially with Alium, is that we are so used to speaking and bouncing ideas off of each other that I don't think that actually translates well outside mm -hmm. of our little bubble. I mean, that's a pretty, we have like a pretty special bubble there where if someone says something and you like it or you don't, we know that if someone's commenting either way, it's for the betterment of the group, not to like just self promote or just to, you know, say something. And I think that doesn't, a lot of the stuff that, a lot of the cultural aspects that we have in Alien really don't translate outside. And I, I think the, I think. Go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, just like you guys said, I have the same problem. I mean, I came in also thinking I wasn't gonna say too much, and I was just gonna listen. And it's like way harder than you would think. I used to hate the attendings who would say, "Well, in residency, we did it this way," or like, "I did this, you guys don't do this." But I find myself doing it, and I like I can step outside my body and see how annoying that is. But for some reason, I can't stop it. <laughs> <laughs> well, a couple of things to, to think about, and, and it comes down to psychological safety. I mean, ALEM is, again, this most incredible environment for, that is psychologically safe. And that is what other teams in healthcare need to aspire to. 
But in a lot of organizations, there's a lot of roles and responsibilities and cultural norms and everything. And most communication is, you know, committee meeting and email and all that. I th my recommendation is, is to actually create an alternative communication method or our culture for that to go. So one of the things we, we actually did in our residency is, you know, we used to have journal clubs and we had committee and everything like that. So what we did was we actually started having a book club and invited the, the you know, the significant others with that. And the communication that I think you're describing at ALEM then would come out in the book clubs, you know, it wasn't about the book because in general book clubs are about the wine and the conversation and about the book. But the fact that there wasn't a book club beforehand, then all of a sudden the innovation and in education happened. The innovation education didn't happen at the residency education committee meeting because of all these roles and, and history and everything. Um, so I, I think there's a huge need for innovation. Uh, but it, if you if you start out with that on the, on the traditional communication things, there may be some clashes in my mind. Does that make sense? I think so. I think there probably is a generational aspect as well to it, where you know Nicole Simran and I. Are we didn't spend our entire lives growing up on the internet, but we just, the majority of our adult lives have been on the internet. And so, you know, for me, let's say I'm having a meeting at work, I don't understand why everyone has to drive an hour and a half to get to the meeting when we can all just meet via Skype online. And it's like, how do you push these ideas to people who are way more senior and also a little bit junior to you as well? Um, yeah, that's a, there, there are some issues as well, you know, regarding, I think, probably a generational aspect, too, um, that I struggle with. <laughs> we all probably struggle with this. No, I would, I mean, I would totally agree. Uh, you know, on, I was at another meeting uh, just before this, and I said, you know, I need to get home to do a Google Hangout. And I'm like, oh, you need to teach me about this. I think people generally will will want to do that, but I, I think if you start messing with a normal communication pattern, I mean, healthcare was based on information and position power, right, for decades. There is no information and position power anymore. It's about networks and it's about strength and everything. So it, it's, it's uh, in, in, in incredible time to be in healthcare and to be in education. And I, I would just personally not take it head on and try to change people that have been doing something for 20 or 30 years and you change the rules all of a sudden. I think uh, you can help a culture or look at the shared vision of where you want to go personally. Uh, but it's, it's, um, it's interesting. The first thing I did when I had my new job was I put our whole GME office on Slack. That did not go well. <laughs> and I presented it as, this is the email killer. You're always complaining about emails. Let's just put everyone on Slack and life will be good. I totally did not seek to understand before I did something like that. Yeah. The, la the other thing is you can communicate uh, most communication is nonverbal. And so in some of these meetings, I often look at the nonverbals. I look, first of all, for the microaggressions as places where I want to stay away from. But then there is a, a, I don't know what the opposite of a microaggression is, but you can tell if people connect with others and connect with something like these are the people that I want my guiding coalition. Of. You know, there's someone that doesn't say a lot, but they're excited about maybe having more of a network way of, 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 of communicating. I mean, that, the last thing I would just say is the future is a network communication. You cannot have linear communication methods in an exponential world. But people are pedaling fast, and and I don't think they can 
change midstream to 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 the culture, let's say that ALEM has built. I'd be interested to hear from anybody on the panel. Have you had any successes, let's say, in either changing a little bit of the culture, changing a little bit of the design from a management point of view, or changing a little bit on the communication system? Um, I've had a little bit of luck, and it did happen kind of against the eyes open, mouth shut advice. And luckily, I have a boss who is very open to like constructive feedback on a situation. So um, I just, you know, we we're kind of, we had a process in place that maybe wasn't working super well and it was pretty different from where I came from. And I didn't just want to be the, well, back where I came from kind of guy. Um, but, you know, just kind of voiced my concerns with the process and tried to put it in a patient-centered fashion and kind of point out, you know, different things that might relate to either patient safety or cost. And that kind of helped maybe change some of the policy a little bit if I kind of put it in the perspective of, well, I think it's affecting the patient rather than you're doing this differently than the way that I used to do this and the way I do it is better, so we should do it my way. Um, and so that was pretty useful, but um, definitely take some finessing of the system and some, you know, more eloquent communication. But, you know, I thought it was all about the numerator. It was all about the facts. If I could only convince the people of the facts that somehow they change their behavior. For me now, it's all about the denominator. It's all about the context. So I spend more of my time trying to change context than I do actually changing the facts. Um, and so there's, for me, in terms of network development, which is, I think, really facilitates management, there's different networks. One, there's a trust network. And if you have a, a large trust network, things just happen easy. And for me, being factual and being trustworthy are two different things. For me, being factual are the facts. Being trustworthy is presenting the facts in the context that the receiver would want it rather than the context that I want to send it. You know, because often so much, especially in academics, so much of the time people mention the facts in a strategic context. You know, it's a context that is... The other one is 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 truly is personal learning networks. If I were had to do it over again, I would actually schedule a half an hour or an hour with all my colleagues in a new place to hear their story. What brought you here? Why are you still here? What are you passionate about? And and learn and see if they have any advice and have it be the true. Uh, um, true listening in that. The third thing is it would be actually creating my own sort of communication network is to see what is the IP or what is important about me. How do I send that information out? And then how do I have sort of the analytics to see what I say, whether it's traction or not? How do I crowdsource ideas to see whether they're going to be? But I would probably from a management point of view is is context is key. It is not the facts in my mind. That seemed pretty accurate. Yeah, it was more, it's, it's definitely more about constructing the conversation versus just trying to yeah, convince somebody of plain facts. Oh, go ahead, please. No, it's just interesting seeing if there's, I'd love to hear of any other, you know, success stories in transitions from people that others could learn from. I think um, I inadvertently, uh, so I came from, I trained in New York, so coming, I came to Jefferson, which is in Philadelphia, and I was at St. Luke's in New York, so I would say Jefferson's a little more 
tertiary care academics. So the residents are always like, oh, you guys, like the new attendings, you like want to see patients right away and uh, you do things like a certain way. So I think there's a few of us who came here from different places, especially from New York, and we kind of um, inadvertently changed the culture here a bit. And it's interesting to hear that uh, from the residents. Um, there are certain things that, that I found frustrating when I got here that are different from the system here, but I had like the same frustrations in a different setting over there. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see like how different things play out and how uh, the residents perceive like that change like in the attendings because I, I didn't even realize it until they started to say it. <laughs> oh, awesome. I mean, I, I think, and that is the beauty. I mean, for, for groups to evolve, I mean, the more diverse the group is, the quicker it'll evolve. And I think people ultimately realize that. Uh, but change sometimes is hard. There's another great book called Tribal Leadership that you can actually tell how, uh, you know, how tribal a group is based on the language they use. Uh, and if it's in sort of a lower level sort of a tribe, sometimes it's really hard to come from an outside and to do any change. One thing that happened um, for me when I started my fellowship was we were, we were, um, it was actually a change in, in a different direction. We, they wanted us to um, use Twitter to help educate residents who were rotating on the ultrasound rotation. And I think it's a great idea. Um, but when it actually came down to it, it was a lot of work and, and no one was using Twitter. And none of the recipients were tweeting back or looking at Twitter. So it was just, a ton of legwork on the fellows part, but our like our leadership wanted us to still do it, and so it took a, actually it took a decent amount of attempts to um, reverse that position so that we didn't actually have to do it anymore. And um, so it was in interesting because we were the ones that, you know who were like, yes, we should use Twitter, we should use foam, and and, ed and educate people. But in the end, it was like, well, they're not really looking at it. We're just wasting our time. Um, so that was kind of an interesting cultural change because it was sort of what you would think would be opposite of what we would want to do if we entered into a new institution. No, and it's so interesting because I, I, um, people ask me about Twitter a lot for, because uh, maybe a little bit of an anomaly in the position I'm in is why am I doing that? I'm, and Twitter is a tool, as you all know, it's, if you don't have a communication or an educational platform, <laughs> the, the thing isn't Twitter, it is how, how, you, uh, how you have a learning organization to pull it out. And I, I think that is the, the, you know, we talked a little bit about generational issues and everything, and I think people tend to objectify things fairly easily, and it's it's the generation or a, a communication method rather than it's actually the platform it's it's and so I I uh, you know some you may be in a great position to influence a discussion and have it at a deeper level. You know, ALEM isn't about Twitter or full med, isn't it? It's, it's actually about constructivist kind of education, you know, about, about networks and all that. But I think people sometimes get caught up on the, on the, um, the tools. And I think that's there what you were talking about. Felix, I have to say, you have a very, um, wonderful way of speaking. Almost every sentence you say is some sort of piece of wisdom or like just gem of your own personal experience or it's a fantastic book reference. So I'm not sure how you can cut out all the fat and just have high yield advice non no. somehow you've been able to do it. And I've been trying to keep some notes um, over this, this lecture and I'm going to have to come back and listen to it some more, but the things I'm taking away from it are really that, I mean, one, one interesting okay. thing we opened up with was that management is not leadership. And I don't really think I thought about it that way, 
um, coming out um, from this or co coming into this lecture. But I'm taking away three um, interesting um, facts that you talked to us about um, with us today. The first is to keep our ears open and our mouths shut. I think all three of us probably learned from that one. And um, hopefully moving forward, we'll try to do that more often. The second thing is really just to try to learn from our mentors, but also our anti-mentors. I don't think I pay enough attention to the people who I I don't want to be like um, in various ways. So I'm going to try to do that more often. And then the third thing is I, I really want to try to seek to understand, as you said, before implementing change. Because I think a lot of times we, especially as new junior attendings or fellows, enter a situation and we're, we want to sort of throw out ideas before we really understand the context, like you said, that denominator. So um, thank you personally for all that great advice. I don't know if Nicole and Simran, if you guys have anything that you're taking away from this, please feel free to share now. I'm pleased to know that I'm not the only one who has violated the, <laughs> um, the mouth closed, eyes open rule. Um, <laughs> and it, it gave me a little bit of um, solace to know that maybe you can do that sometimes if you do it in the right way, so I don't feel as bad about maybe being such a huge offender of that rule. Um, it's good to know that I'm, I'm not the only one in this boat, but I agree. Everything that you say is pretty much like advice gold, and like I said, I love your book recommendations, so I'm always excited to, to spend time chatting with you. It's awesome. If, if you could send us like some of those book recommendations Thank and, you. and, and things on uh, better management, that would be great. I would love it. Well, Felix, I want to say thanks again for um, giving us your pearls and wisdom. Well, uh, here's the books. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't see it. <laughs> and thank you so much for, um, for giving us your great So sorry. We all appreciate it. No. No, and thank you, and thank you for taking the time. I, I, you're the future, and it's it's amazing uh, uh, the things you're doing. So I feel really grateful and blessed to be involved in this conversation. So thank you so much. All right, and without further ado, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thanks, you guys, for participating, and thanks, everyone, who's tuning in. We'll see you at the next Google Hangout. Take care.